Um, but we've got two talks about immutability today, which is really cool. Um, fortunately, I'm giving the first one, so I don't have to sit in this talk rewriting it based on what I just heard. Um, <laughs> um, but so, um, yeah, I think immutability is a really interesting subject, and I'm going to talk a bit about why I found it interesting and why we don't use it as much as we kind of dream about using it. Um, I'm from... I'm Justin Cormack. I'm an engineer at Docker in Cambridge. That's Cambridge. It's a science village in the middle of England. Um, and I work on uh, operating systems and uh, Linux containers and um, container security and all the kind of low layer of the stack, really. I've, I've always been a kind of low layer of the stack type person. Um, and some history about immutability, really. Um, at the beginning of config management, I think um, there was this article by Steve saying really that the, 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 the baseline of what you want to do is describe an arbitrary state of the disk, because that's the state of the computer. Um, and that wasn't specifically that it shouldn't change, but um, it was really, it was Netflix who came along and said, the kind of uh, the, the first real thing about immutability, which was that we just want to burn an AMI, we want to run it, and if we want to change it, we're just going to do that again with a different one. And, and that was the kind of the, the first real article about um, about this whole idea of immutable infrastructure, and it got people quite excited at the time. I think I remember I remember that. Um, there was a kind of another thread which this quote kind of represents, which was just the. If you've worked with systems and you and they've been running for a long time, the, the state of them gradually kind of decays, bit rot. Um, you know, config management systems try and keep keep that that in order, but they don't you know don't always manage. But it, obviously, manually managed servers, this is the worst. Someone SSHs in and changes something five years ago, and then you don't even know if it's going to restart or whatever. Um, and so again, this idea that if it doesn't change, you know what state it's in. Um, another kind of more recent thing is the whole idea of application-specific um, systems, and just not not just starting with a general-purpose system, but starting with something that's kind of designed for the application you're actually running and is very minimal. And that's a, that's a kind of more recent idea that came out of around. Um, when people started using containers more, it's like, I just want to run containers. Why am I running all this general purpose OS? Let's do something specific. And so, so these kind of threads are kind of um, things that really um, influenced on my kind of thinking about immutability. Um, and the other problem is kind of the problem about doing updates at all. I mean, updating software is kind of hard, and um, you have to. Uh, you have to really try to, you have to understand the program you're trying to restart to work out how to, how it should update, what, what, should, what should actually change, what you have to restart. Um, people do write code that can update itself without uh, any downtime. Um, they're mostly Erlang programmers. Um, occasionally other people try. And, and it's a kind of heroic effort of, of um, keeping connections live and keeping the system live while you swap out the binary that's running underneath it. Um, it but most, most programs, if you want to reconfigure them or change them, you basically have to kind of have some sort of downtime. And that's kind of inconvenient. And the, again, the whole immutable idea is that the system may go down, the, the individual machine may go down, but the system as a whole, the distributed system, always stays up um, and is always serving requests because you basically spin up a new machine before you take, tear down the old one. So there's always something serving your requests. And so you, I think a lot of the theme about immutable infrastructure is that the, the problems are best solved in a, in a higher level as part of a distributed system rather than trying to get everything absolutely perfect on an individual machine. Um, so individual components may go out of service, but the system as a whole. This is the kind of thing we were talking about yesterday about immutable is not 
really a great word. Um, but disposable is really what we're talking about. You know, you can throw these machines away, but it's the, the, we, we should be thinking about these things as a whole distributed system because you're always going to have a distributed system for reliable, if you want a reliable system in the first place. If you've, only, if you've got a single machine, you haven't got any kind of reliability anyway. So, um, you know, turning it off and, and on is always going to give you downtime. Um, the other thing, of course, is state. Um, obviously, immutability doesn't imply that there's no state, because that would be stupid. You always have state. Um, and things change. But one of the things about um, kind of traditional uh, Unix sort of system that's designed, I mean, our kind of Unix model is very much designed from the Unix workstation of the, of the 90s. The, you know, the Sun workstation is our kind of <laughs> canonical model of what a, what a what a system should look like. Um, and it has a very kind of messy notion of state. Any, any file on the system can be modified. There's not, you know, you can, to update an application, you change things in user bin, to changing config, it's things in etc. But actually things just get changed all over the place and the state is really quite complicated. Um, and I think the, the, the thing about Immutable systems is you, you want to try really hard to divide um, immutable code, which is this is what I want to run, this is the function of this computer, this is, this, this is my application, and this is the data that my application actually is designed to change. This is the stuff that's important to me. This is my database that is actually the, the state of the application. This is my information about users, this is the stuff that I'm, I'm, that's my kind of business value. This is the, those are the bits that obviously, uh, they're obviously mutable because we don't, we write very few actually stateless applications and they're not terribly interesting. Most, all interesting applications have mutable state. Um, and so immutable systems is not about saying nothing ever changes because that would be, but it's about Isolating the bits that change and knowing where they are and being able to, you know, back them up and copy them to other systems easily and so on. Um, I think functional programming is a good analogy. Um, the idea, the input, the key takeaway in functional programming again is not that nothing ever changes, but it's that you don't have mutable global state. You don't just write into global variables, which then affects everything that happens afterwards. You understand state change. You make it explicit. You pass states between um, between functions explicitly. Um, you invent ways of thinking about state, like monads, if you're obsessive. Um, but the the idea is that not that there's no state change. It's that there's understandable state change, um, an explicit state change, um, and you choose where the state is, and you can manage it. Um, Landscape, which I'll talk about a bit later, has got um, you know, a mutable root file system. With that. It's, it's read-only. You really can't change it. Um, and then you explicitly add a drive where, or multiple drives where you actually put application mutable data. Um, and so you, you have to explicitly make sure that you're putting things in the writable area, and that's, that's part of your, explicitly part of your persistent state. Um, so that makes it kind of more controlled. Um, and you, you try, I think not changing code is important. Code comes from your version control pipeline. It, you know, it comes out of um, your continuous delivery system. It doesn't, code shouldn't just suddenly be changing in a running system. Um, I work at Docker. We, we, I uh, spend a lot of time with building things with systems with containers. And um, somehow we managed to persuade people when we introduced containers, or popularized containers rather, that uh, you shouldn't be updating the state inside your containers. There are people who uh, will run a config management tool inside their container and do uh, system updates. But those people are weird and fortunately <laughs> extremely uncommon. Um, and um, I think what's interesting is that we, we uh, I think you have an advantage when you introduce a new tool that you can actually give people new ways of working. Um, 
and and they kind of they kind of stick because they kind of they learn about containers and they don't think of them uh, well. Docker was really careful about that. Actually, LXC was very much the opposite. They've decided that containers were like VMs and you should update them. And um, Docker was became more popular and said you shouldn't do that. And we kind of, I think, in, in for most use cases, we kind of you know, kind of won in that way. And I think we managed to get immutability as a as a way that people think about containers. Um, they haven't noticed that you can update them, uh, and hopefully they never will. Um, <laughs> I did hear about a tool last year, and I was like, what? <laughs> um, um, one, of the, one of the reasons I think that I'm, that I'm interested in immutable infrastructure is that um, distributed systems are really hard and complicated, and they're big scale, and they're really actually fascinating, and they're the, kind of, they're the area where um, the complicated bits of your system actually are. Distributed systems you know, have scaling and consistency and replication problems and all the really fun and hard problems. Um, writing distributed applications is n absolutely non-trivial. Um, and I, that's the area where I think we should be thinking about config management. It's where the interesting config management tooling of the next decade is going to be is going to be absolutely for managing distributed systems and all these issues around scaling, replication, managing failure, consistency, and all those things that are that are really fun. The bits on a single machine, are, you know, single machines are just the unit for this big, interesting distributed system that we're we're building. And I think that. Personally, I think we should make them the actual machine bit as simple as possible and not really worry about it and not, not really care so much about it. Um, again, I think that the sort of evolution of kind of our, our kind of Unix systems from the personal workstation meant that they were very you know, pet-like and people like to manage every little detail about them and, and make them really complicated and configure and install loads of tools on them and things like that. Um, in a kind of world where every 99% of all computers that actually run are not log, no human ever logs in or uses them. They, they, we're designing tooling for for automation now, um, and so um, we should be designing for you know for machines to use, not for people to use, and. Um, and so I think we need to kind of move away from those kind of old models and just and really think about the big problems of distributed systems. Um, little sort of sideline: Why are there no immutable infrastructure products? Um, I think I had this conversation with Gareth kind of about a year ago, maybe. Um, it was kind of interesting thing. The most common tooling people use is Packer, um, which arguably is the closest thing to a kind of commercial immutable infrastructure tool, even though. It's not, it, it's not specifically for immutable infrastructure, it's just a general tool. Um, the workflows with Packer are really complicated um, because you kind of have to boot up a machine, configure it, install it, freeze it, snapshot it, and boot it up and install some more things. And you have to use a whole bunch of other tools as well because Packer doesn't do everything, so you need a, another set of configuration management tools. Um, but it is, it is what a lot of people use. Um, I think one of the reasons that it is actually it's kind of hard with immutable infrastructure tooling to make a standard enterprise pricing model. Um, there's nothing, if your machines are immutable, there's nothing running on them um, that is a, a, a configuration management or product. So it's hard to get people to pay for things that are not actually running on their critical machines at all. The, the, the whole cost model doesn't really work. Um, so I think most of this, this tooling we're going to have to build is going to be open source community tooling, which is fine. Um, I ended up building a tool for doing this because I couldn't find anything I liked. Um, started uh, 2015 now. It was originally as part of um, building Docker for Mac. We needed a so not really the same sort of problem space at all, but we needed a kind of invisible Linux to go inside that. Um, if you look at, go back to the first commit, it says, not required, self-update, treat it as immutable. Um, so that was always kind of the thought from the beginning. 
Um, but it was open sourced. We open sourced last year as a totally general toolkit um, for all sorts of different use cases. Um, and so um, it, it's no longer kind of specifically for, for the original use cases. Um, it's very much a config management tool, even though people kind of look at it and maybe think it's a sort of Linux distro or something. It's not um, in the CNCF tooling landscape. It's very much in there with Puppet and Chef and, and so on. Um, it's a kind of, as I'll show you a little bit more detail later, but it's really basically a dumb tool to make things out of files um, and create file systems that then don't change. Um, it uses containers to kind of make this simpler. Um, but it's really built for automation and continuous delivery, and that's, that's, that's kind of the, the thinking around everything. Um, it's a kind of toolkit, um, which is where the components and containers, because I kind of like containers, and they're kind of a convenient way, and they're easy to use. They're kind of easier for normal users to create than distro packages, so I think they're quite um, friendly from that point of view. Um, it, everything's designed to be run in a continuous delivery pipeline, so and it's designed to be quick. I hate slow tools. Um, it everything takes about it takes about a minute. So I'll show you in a minute. But it's kind of that minute's really annoying now because building a traditional Linux distro from scratch takes like ages. Uh, but when you cut something down to a minute, it then is too slow. Um, and you so we're actually working on making it a bit faster because it's you know seconds would be better than minutes. Um, it's designed like everything you, you know you, you test it in production and then ship it, um, and it's designed to be small and fast generally. I mean you can make big images, but generally small is good. As small and simple is good. I like simple things. Um, as I said, yeah, packages kind of are in the system are containers, because and that's the kind of unit of. Um, it's a bigger chunk than a distro package because it includes everything the tooling you need runs needs to run, so all the libraries and things like that, um, which has pros and cons. It, um, less sharing, bit of bit of extra waste as you might have a few more copies of things, but then they can be different versions, um, and. Um, Easier to test in isolation and easier to reuse in isolation, I think, which is which it makes them makes it kind of simpler. Um, and you can run all the components as um, with some isolation because they run in containers, which is kind of nice. So you get a bit of extra isolation. In principle, you could run them in VMs as well as separate components. Um, uh, the architecture of our Flinus kit is designed to be as simple as possible. Um, it's exactly the same design as the pod in Kubernetes, which um, is kind of nice, I think. Um, so you basically have the simplest possible thing, which is sequential startup, so it's deterministic and you understand what's going on to get your system ready. That means um, mounting things, setting up networking, um, network file system, any kind of setup you need before you're ready to run applications, and then you run your applications. Um, they run using Containerd, which is a small embeddable container runtime, and your applications start up in parallel and run for the rest of the time, and then there's actually a short shutdown phase, optional shutdown phase as well. Um, you could replace this all with systemd if you wanted and make it more complicated, um, but um, I don't know, I just, uh, it's as simple as it needs to be, and I kind of like the, um, the design being the same as the Kubernetes pods. It was actually originally coincidental, and then I kind of made sure it stayed that way. Um, someone actually made a tool for converting those images into pods and vice versa, I think. Um, we use a YAML file. I don't like YAML, but I couldn't think, find a better alternative. Um, and it's OK. Um, so the YAML file corresponds to essentially to that, to that structure. You tell it what you want to do at boot time. In this case, we want to run DHCP to set up some networking. This is uh, just the simplest possible setup. And then this one just runs Redis. And you tell it, obviously, you need to tell it what kernel you want to run, that kind of 
basic, uh, and which version of container DM run C you want to use to actually start the thing up. Um, every, uh, it's an, um, designed for immutable system, so the whole root file system can't be changed. Sorry, no. Um, you can't, there's no way to update it at runtime, really, because it's all immutable. Um, you can, if you want to dynamically run service on top, you, you know, one of our use cases is running Docker. And so also we run Kubernetes, the Docker for Mac. Uh, Kubernetes support on desktop is just a Linux kit image that runs Kubernetes. Um, so then you can dynamically run containers on top of that if you want. Um, but if you want to update the version of Docker, you have to rebuild a new image and restart it. Um, just some kind of practicalities of using it. Um, we've got a lot of tooling for just making images. It's the kind of practical sort of stuff you have to do. Um, so um, basically, we can build ISOs and raw disk images and AMIs and the kind of usual stuff that is extremely inconsistent between systems. Um, um, so you can basically build whatever you need, whatever your to, your computer needs to boot off. Um, it's kind of easy. I think we cover most of the things now. Um, and then there's a kind of build, push, and run workflow for the kind of common use cases. Um, obviously, the, the big cloud providers, um, the kind of VMware vCenter and OpenStack and other things that people use, IPXC, that kind of thing, and then a bunch of desktop setups for testing, um, and uh, so building stuff locally, we like desktops. Um, so you build your YAML file, you push it to GCP, and then you run it at GCP. That's just designed as a, as a kind of build and development workflow. You obviously really run stuff on GCP by uh, using whatever tooling you use for GCP, use Terraform, whatever you like. You know, you don't obviously, we're not building production tooling. We're just building stuff to play with that gives you a serial console and things, useful things like that. Um, let me show you basically what this looks like. Um, so I've got a really simple YAML file that runs um, Nginx. It uses the um, standard Nginx Alpine image off Docker Hub. Um, so you're just saying you can just pick something that's a standard container and run it a as a system. And it runs a 4978 kernel, and it sets up DHCP to get its networking. And we're just going to build it to run it locally. So let's build, build our Linux distro. Is it? Uh, I need to get rid of the ex ex certificate expiry warnings. They're a bit verbose. And uh, as they're auto-rotated, they're a bit pointless. Um, so you see, it's a bit annoyingly slow. You know, it'd be nice if it was just zoop, fix that soon. Um, and we've just output a kernel in at Ramda so we can run, because that's useful for running locally. Let's boot that up, and um, we have Linux. Um, we're running Nginx. We can uh, we can wget it. We can see here's your welcome to Nginx because we didn't change any other, we didn't add any other config in, but we've basically booted a system that has um, Nginx running in a container, very little else. Um, uh, oh, we've got um, that's namespace now, isn't it? Uh, um, So we can look and see what um, system services are running. And we can see it's Nginx and the random number service are running. Um, and that's, you know, that's basically, um, and then we can destroy our system um, because it's a, it's, systems are disposable, immutable, you know. <laughs> you can just create as many as you like, test them, make, um, us, the CI infrastructure for Linux Kit tests like, hundreds of systems every time we do a build. It's, um, it's, you know, it's really kind of um, designed, for, designed for machines. 
uh, not not people. And I think that's you know it's um, you know you, that that machine had a login console, but that's just because it's a demo. Um, there's you can perfectly well build systems that really don't have any kind of human interaction. Um, um, the kind of roadmap, really, I mean, I think that one of the things we're trying to do is, uh, at the moment, the one of the reasons why the build process is a little bit slow is it um, runs using Docker containers, and we're just going to uh, try and remove all that and do it directly in Go code, because then it will be even for, it'll be easier to run in CI um, because a lot of people don't have CI systems that actually give you access to build containers. It's kind of uh, so we'd like to remove that, make it faster, um, make it run unprivileged, and everything. Um, we're working on removing some of the bits of shell scripting that inevitably creep into all systems. Um, we got rid of a lot of shell scripts. There's not certain, there's hardly any left actually, um, but we'd like to get rid of all of those. Um, and we're, we've got people working on interesting new use cases, um, uh, IoT systems, embedded systems, uh, Kubernetes. We, uh, we've got a whole platform, Kubernetes platform built on this that we use. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about why no one's actually using immutable infrastructure. <laughs> Well, by no one, of course, I mean hardly, you know, it's the, it's the 0 0.xx percent kind of thing. Um, there's not much tooling, um, and tooling is kind of useful. I mean, tooling gives you ideas about how you might do things and make, gets you down the endless thing of making more tooling. Um, uh, Packer was really the only other thing I came across when I started doing this, and it was um, apart from a bunch of horrendous tooling for embedded systems. Um, I used to work in embedded systems, and that tooling is gross. Um, uh, but I just, Packer was just too complicated for me. As I said, I, was, I liked it. One of the things about LensKit is you can run it all on your laptop. You, you can build an AMI and push it to Amazon and run it without actually booting an AMI. A machine in AWS at all, except the one you actually want to run at the end, um, and that that kind of and that's a re really a requirement to be able to run it in your CI pipeline. Is the last thing I was doing my CI pipeline is boot a machine on AWS because then it's like oh, annoying, um, or um, you know it means it means that you your, your CI pipeline gets really complicated. So being able to make everything locally was a was a requirement for that. I've, I kind of really liked. Um, there are some sort of almost almost immutable systems, Core OS, Container Linux. I mean, sorry, the, uh, it's it's hard to remember. The, like, it changed that name. It's a very unmemorable name. Um, is almost immutable, but it's really annoyingly difficult to customize because it's kind of a a weirdly complicated Gen two build system that. Um, and I kind of gave up Gen two many years ago. Um, <laughs> I did like it. <laughs> um, then there's the kind of why people aren't using it because they're very wedded to enterprise Linux because they're enterprises. It's good name, good marketing name, you know. Call it enterprise, and people will buy it. Um, they there doesn't seem to be much of a there's this. I mean, all the kind of enterprise Linux vendors are making simpler, but not immutable, but almost you know, kind of towards that. Versions, um, so it's sort of semi-immutable, and and that's but they're not really pushing them because they like the money that they get from enterprise Linux. Um, uh, there are some issues at scale that I think are kind of important. Um, I um, Netflix are always quoted as these people who use immutable infrastructure. It appears that they don't anymore, um, uh, and. Th because there are some kind of weirdnesses. So apparently, if you have um, 10,000 machines on AWS and you decide to reboot them all, you don't get 10,000 machines back in any kind of reasonable time scale because the cloud is not actually as kind of as elastic and wondrous and everything as they make out. Um, uh, so they're kind of, uh, they like to keep their 10,000 machines most of the time and not. Uh, um, that's not to say that 
uh, having this conversation with them that they're happy with uh, with any of the other config management tools either. They would, you know, they, I think when you do things at, at really big scale, all all problems are difficult and um, uh, there are no good answers and everything sucks. And that's obviously important problems that from which new innovation comes. Um, you can do the kind of reboot or k-exec kind of model um, where you just, rather than having, a, you know, rather than build, throwing away your AWS instance and starting a new one, just write a new image to it and then reboot it or just do a k-exec and, and re reset the state of the thing. Um, there's a bunch of, uh, I mean, CoreOS has that AB update model, which is, um, which you could use. Um, there's some kind of reasons not to do that. It is more complicated. Um, and it's very hard to know, from a security point of view, um, it's really nice to know exactly what you're running um, when you restart based on the MI. There's no real way in something like AWS you can really tell uh, what's on your disk when you're going to reboot and whether it's actually what you think. It's very hard to validate that kind of thing um, because they don't give you any kind of tooling for that. So I think there are, there are, there are issues at scale and I think that those are things that need to be worked on. Um, but I think that um, you, I think that the immutability is kind of still interesting from this point of view and that um, it will kind of help people. Um, but that, but it, it's, it still requires work. It's not, not a trivial kind of let's just sw switch this over. Um, but and also I do agree with Adam's statement yesterday that it is absolutely time to do some crazy bullshit with operating systems. I think that, um, I mean, I've been kind of, that's what I've been working on for the last, you know, several, many years, I think, in different kind of ways, so with unikernels and Lenskate and things like that. I think there's um, tooling, I mean, operating systems were, yeah, as I said, were designed for people's interactive use and not for being part of a system where they're driven by computers for computers. Um, and, and I think that, um, so there's, there's these key points of, you know, we're running distributed systems, think about the system as a whole, build it out of simpler, com simpler components that are easier to understand, uh, build it for automation, and don't kind of keep on with the kind of traditional, you know, way of doing things just because you've always done it like that. Think about why, why we're doing what we're doing and what, how you can make it easier to understand things like state and complexity and your system as a whole. And um, please give uh, let's get a try. It's really fun to use. Actually, it's like you can make systems really easily. It's quite it's it's quite cool. It's like it's like, like how Linux should be, you know, just really, really simple. Build something in a few minutes, try it out, throw it away, yeah, use it as a prototyping tool, whatever, or, or just borrow our code and use it and make something even better. That would be nice. Um, thanks. We probably have... Oh, well, it's 11.40 exactly. We might have time for one question if there's a question. I don't know. Or come and find me, Lisa, if you've got... Yep. Yeah. Core has a tool called Ignition. Are you aware of that? How to put the fit in Linux kit somehow? Or it... Remind me which one Ignition is. I, do. I have come across it, but I've forgotten which. It's, it's sort of a boot engine, but then formats the disk. Oh, yeah, Ignition. Yeah, sorry, Ignition. For, for me. Yeah, we, yes, it would fit. You could definitely use it. We have had people looking at using Ignition with Learners Kit. Um, we've, we've got a bunch of tooling that, um, that we built originally for some of our use cases that um, kind of does a lot of the same things as Ignition, uh, but you could definitely, I mean, Learners Kit basically, as I said, is a kit. You just you can put in whichever components you like, and we provide some that are useful for us. Uh, but yeah, you could definitely um, replace, you can replace all of it with it, whatever you like. Um, but yeah, Ignition is, is a, a similar model. It does a lot of the same things. Um, I th and it, yeah, it could definitely be used. I think a, lo a lot of the, um, 
There was no particularly good reason why we didn't reuse the, some of the core OS components. We could have done, I think, um, but I yeah, there's a lot of uh, kind of overlap in the stuff they did. And, um, uh, and um, yeah, so it's definitely, a, definitely possible. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can you can definitely do that. You can, I mean, you can basically, uh, you know, rewrite the boot disk or, or uh, run a yeah. You could run a separate bootloader or, or something on AWS. Yeah, there's there's lots of options. I think um, it's just a question of trying things out and seeing what works. But but you could yeah, you can definitely you can definitely reuse AWS instances uh, rather than recycling them. It's just that. Um, uh, we, we haven't got a nice integrated bit of tooling for doing that at the moment, but it would be definitely, I, mean, I think that it was only kind of recently, I was talking to someone at Netflix when I got this, I was started thinking about this issue in particular, um, because it, it wasn't something that's immediately obvious. Um, that, because um, at small scale, it works fine just recycling instances, and it's kind of cleaner and neater, but at large scale, it's, yeah, it's got issues. Yeah. Um, I think that you know the the FreeBSD jails manager kind of is more like a kind of replacement for or kind of alternative to kind of Docker in a way that the bit that runs inside the jail. Um, well, this is kind of um, the system that kind of runs the system as a whole. I think that I have thought about um, what. What Lens Kit would look like on FreeBSD, and I think it's kind of an interesting thing. But I'm also, I kind of, um, I've also been trying to prod various people to restart the kind of work on getting Docker to work with FreeBSD again. It's kind of, and, can, and I did some work on little bits of work on the ContainerD ports, FreeBSD, and things like that. So um, we still need some more work. But um, yeah, I think, um, yeah. We can talk about that later, but yeah, there's there's definitely like possibilities of making something similar for FreeBSD. I think we're kind of out of time because um, we got, but um, we've got another talk about immutability now, so you can ca ask your same questions at the end of the next talk. <laughs> <laughs>